Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this evening is this portion of our Gospel lesson for the second Wednesday in Advent, from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 11th chapter. Jesus, speaking of John the Baptist, says, To what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates, We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. This is the text. Dear brothers and sisters in the Lord Christ Jesus, I think that most of us can agree that music has a profound effect on us. Throughout my life, I've found that my mood can be pretty well controlled by music. Early on, when we would ride on long family trips in my dad's car, he would play cassette tapes. And he wanted to train us up to appreciate the very best of music from an early age, so we usually listened to Baroque music. When we were out and about, my dad would react with horror to a lot of the music that was played over loudspeakers. I remember one trip in particular to Pizza Hut, where this rock song seemed like it just wouldn't end, kind of like some of my sermons. It felt like it was wrapping up, and then it got started again, and my dad would audibly groan as this song drew on and on. So I thought that my dad hated all rock music. Imagine my shock, therefore, when I got into the family car one day and heard electric guitars and drums. It scandalized me. My family, these people that I thought I knew, were listening to rock music. It was the Beach Boys. I could hardly believe it. Well, after that gentle introduction to some of the rock music that my parents did enjoy, I really came to like the Beach Boys and other golden oldies. Later in life, I discovered that my dad had quite the LP collection, Led Zeppelin and Elton John and Steppenwolf and things like that. He never would have allowed us to discover that when we were younger. But really, the first time that I got deeply into music was when my aunt got me a boombox for my birthday. And another aunt of mine, my godmother, got me my first CD when compact discs were pretty new. She got me the soundtrack to Jurassic Park. Now, you wouldn't think that a movie about dinosaurs would have fantastic music, but I would encourage you, go back and Watch Jurassic Park again. Listen to some of that beautiful music composed by John Williams. It's shockingly lovely for an action movie about dinosaurs. I was deeply moved by it. I would sit there in my bedroom and listen to it on my brand new boom box, and I found that it really could affect my mood. In fact, there was a wide range of moods represented in the soundtrack. I'd play some music if I was feeling down. I'd feel different music if I was feeling up. And then, throughout high school, I made quite the collection of movie soundtracks. If I had approached a girl I liked at school and she turned me down, I would go home depressed, dragging my feet, and I'd play the most mournful movie soundtracks I could think of. If I was really glad because I'd just gotten the lead in the school play, I'd play something exciting and fun that matched my mood. Eventually, I got into some really... I guess, emotionally intense mood music, so to speak. And now I look back on it and I see that it wasn't always the healthiest thing. Sometimes I fed bad moods with depressing music. Since then, I've come to use music as something like medicine. When I'm in a, a down mood, I won't play the most jubilant music, but I'll play music that is serious yet hopeful and has the power to lift me up out of the emotional mire. And then, of course, I do still enjoy music that makes me tap my feet. 
music that I dare say almost makes me want to dance, though nobody's ever going to catch me dancing again. Music, unless you're made of stone, really has an effect on you. But what our gospel lesson presents to us is a class of people that is entirely, seemingly unmoved by music. We're talking about the opponents of Jesus and of John the Baptist. Now, of course, if you were to go back and play ancient Palestinian dance music, I'm sure they would have tapped their feet too. But in the illustration that Jesus gives, he speaks of children playing different kinds of music in the marketplace. Sometimes they play their flutes, they play delightful dance music, but their playmates won't respond to the music they're playing. They play this music that would make us tap our feet, but the playmates remain stock still. And then they play a mournful dirge, music for those who are in the depths of emotional despair. And the playmates don't react at all. They don't mourn, they don't grieve, they don't shed any tears. It is as if there is no music at all. The musicians find their audience callous, stone cold, emotionless, unresponsive. Of course, the question for us is, who is who in this parable? What is Jesus teaching us about? Well, John the Baptist and Jesus are the musicians. And they're playing very different kinds of music between them. John the Baptist is singing a dirge. He's playing mournful funeral music in his preaching. And yet, the Pharisees and scribes refuse to mourn. Jesus, on the other hand, is playing the flute. He's playing delightful dance music that fills the heart with joy. And yet, the Pharisees and scribes remain unmoved. So how is it that John plays a dirge while Jesus plays a dance? Consider the great difference between their styles of preaching. Now, John the Baptist was capable of preaching the gospel in all its sweetness. It is he who preached, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Some of the most comforting words in Holy Scripture, and we celebrate the comforting preaching of John the Baptist in our hymn today. But that preaching was rather rare for John. What mostly characterized John's preaching was judgment, condemnation, the dread call to repentance lest we fall under the terrible wrath of God. It's interesting to consider how John the Baptist presents Jesus in his preaching. He predicts the coming of Jesus, and he doesn't say he's going to come so meek. He's going to come in peace. He's going to spread the grace of God over the globe. That's not what John says in his preaching. He says his winnowing fork is in his hand. He's going to scoop up the threshed wheat and toss it into the air so that the wind will blow away the chaff, the useless husk. And the wheat will remain. The wheat he will gather into his barns, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And unless you repent, you are chaff. You are destined for burning, for the wrath of God, for the judgment. That's how John presents Jesus. He has his final judgment in mind. We're going to hear more about John's perspective on Jesus as a God coming in vengeance and judgment on Sunday. But for now, suffice it to say that of all the things John could preach about Jesus, what he chooses to preach most is judgment, vengeance, the executing of righteousness, casting out the unbelievers, the unjust, the sinners, the impenitent, and bringing into his kingdom only those who by faith in the Son of God, are righteous. John the Baptist preached fire and brimstone. He preached a mournful message that in many resulted in tears, in mourning, 
We see the crowds coming to John the Baptist and they respond to his tune appropriately. They repent. They submit themselves to him and to God's judgment. They acknowledge their transgression. They own up to their sin. And so in true repentance and faith, in lowliness and meekness of heart, they descend into the waters of the Jordan and undergo John's baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. They weep over their transgressions. They mourn as they hear the preaching of John the Baptist, and it is appropriate that they should. Not so the scribes and Pharisees. They come down to John in skepticism. They're looking for an excuse not to have to heed his call to repentance, and boy, do they find one. You just have to look at him to see that John the Baptist is a fanatic. He's dressed strangely. He's got this garment of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. He looks like a wild man. Well, in fact, he looks exactly like the scriptures say Elijah the prophet looked. He doesn't even have a normal diet. He fasts all the time. And when he does eat, he eats locusts and wild honey. He's mad. He's crazy. He's insane. He has a demon, they say. And because they can shoehorn him into the insanity category, they're free from having to listen to him. They don't have to mourn in response to the mournful tune that he plays in his preaching. Anyone who listened to John with sincerity would weep, but the scribes and Pharisees remain cold. They're made of stone. They're unmoved. How callous. How inhuman. But then, of course, Jesus finds the same thing. Jesus comes singing a very different tune than John the Baptist. John was preaching repentance. He was preaching judgment, preaching condemnation, warning of the wrath to come. And now you can find that, of course, in the preaching of Jesus. John the Baptist and Jesus did preach the same thing. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But Jesus overwhelmingly preached grace and mercy. Jesus preached himself as the kingdom of God come among his people. Jesus proclaimed the glad tidings of great joy, that he was come to deliver us from our sins, to give his life as a ransom for many. He was here to heal the sick, to cleanse the lepers, to raise the dead, to free the imprisoned, to give recovery of sight to the blind. He was here to work all these wondrous miracles for the people of God. In John's Gospel, Jesus specifically says, I'm not here for judgment. I'm not here to condemn. I'm here to bring the grace and mercy and truth of God. What is that but the joyous Gospel? Jubilant strains that should lift up the heart of those who hear. If you could translate Jesus' preaching into music, it would be a delightful dance that makes the heart sing. And that is, in fact, what we find in those who follow Jesus, in his apostles, in the holy women who supported the apostolic ban from their means, in the 70 disciples who preached in Jesus' name, in the all of those crowds that were teeming around him to hang on every word he proclaimed, these people experienced the joy of the gospel. Their hearts danced in the knowledge of the grace and mercy of God in Christ Jesus. They exulted to know that Jesus came to forgive their sins, to pardon their transgressions, to give them his own righteousness as theirs, to lead them safely into the kingdom of heaven, to give them eternal life. They danced, in a manner of speaking, in response to the sweet and joyous music of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so they should have done. Not so the scribes and the Pharisees. They hear the joyous strains of Jesus' gospel, and they don't want to admit that it's true. 
They don't want to yield to it. They harden their hearts to it and refuse to tap their feet. They refuse to be moved. They refuse to dance. They refuse to let their hearts sing. They dismiss him and say, look, he's a glutton. He's a drunkard. John's disciples fasted all the time, but Jesus' disciples hardly fast at all. Well, Jesus had an explanation for that. I'm the bridegroom, and it is not fitting that the wedding party should fast while the bridegroom is with them. My church will have plenty of time to fast in the latter days when I am taken away from them visibly. But now, when I'm here, when your joy is filled and complete, this is not the time for fasting. A glutton and a drunkard, they say, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. He speaks mercy, he speaks peace, he forgives sins. They dismiss him as someone who need not concern them. They hear the music of his glorious gospel preaching and they are unmoved, impenitent, unbelieving. What a terrible thing. Can you imagine hearing the most beautiful music you've ever heard in your life and approaching it purely analytically as something that has no power to move your heart, to touch your spirit. Can you imagine being dead to the gospel? That's what the scribes and Pharisees were. And Jesus warns us, lest we too fall into that trap. How do we respond to the music of God's Word. When God's Word is proclaimed to us, do we respond to it as an object of study kept at a safe distance? Do we come up with ways to dismiss it as fanatical, silly, something that need not concern us over much? Or do we submit to it in faith and receive appropriately the preaching of God's Word? when we hear the law of God proclaimed in all its severity, when we hear the Ten Commandments and know that God regulates not only our deeds, not only our hands, not only externals, but even our thoughts and inmost desires, when we know that God's expectation is that we should be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, when we know that we have all fallen short of the glory of God, and are liable to judgment and death. When we hear that message, we ought to hear it as mournful music that strikes us to the heart, that leads us to mourn, that leads us to shed tears of repentance and sorrow over sin. It should leave us feeling very somber and serious. If you wrestle with God's Word in sincerity and truth, the Spirit of God does bring forth such a response. And by doing so, He paves the way for an even better message. He paves the way for the hearing of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. When you hear the Scriptures proclaimed, when you hear that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He has taken your sin for Himself, and He alone now bears it. When you hear, like John preached, that Jesus truly is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, who takes away your sin, when you hear that He has suffered and died as your atoning sacrifice to reconcile you to the Father, to remove God's wrath from you forever, when you hear that your sins are forgiven and that they therefore have no more power to condemn you, when you hear that though your sins be as scarlet, God will make you white as snow. When you hear that there is laid up for you a crown of glory, of everlasting life. When you hear that your death is but a slumber, and there are glories inexpressible lying just beyond it. When you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ telling you that on the last day you will rise again in glory, you will stand before Him in joy, and you will enter into His everlasting kingdom in peace and live with Him and with His holy church forever. When you hear those glad tidings of great joy, does it not make your heart sing? Doesn't it fill you with joy and peace in believing? 
if the Holy Spirit is there, and He is, if He's doing His work through God's Word as He promised to do, and He is, then God does bring forth such a response in you. He remakes you, remolds you by His Gospel, and when you hear it, you can't help but dance in your spirit. May God preserve us from callous and cold listening of His Word. May God fill us with His Spirit that when we hear His Word, we mourn when He calls us to repentance and rejoice when He pronounces upon us the peace of the forgiveness of sins. And may we come finally to that glorious music of life eternal, which none of us have yet heard. But I hear the music is fantastic. Amen. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.